heart need you being come to sense But fumble in a greasy till And add the half pence to the pence Prayer to shivering prayer until Do you all see that? Yeah, that's great, Myra. That's perfect. Okay, um, so first of all, I just want to say um, what an honor it is to be delivering the Tony McManus lecture. Um, when I mentioned this to some of my colleagues at the Institute of Northern Studies at UHI, one of them said he actually had been taught by Tony McManus and what a wonderful and inspiring teacher he was. And he said he's only since come to realize all the other activities that Tony was engaged in as well. Um, so clearly he was a, a man of many talents. Um, and um, for some of this lecture, I'll be drawing um, quite a bit on Tony's book, The Radical Field, which I shall draw attention to later. Um, and to say that, you know, if geopoetics is fairly new to you, I think this would be, it's not an introduction because it's quite a, it's quite a weighty book and quite a complex book, but it's very accessible. Um, so I think if you're looking for a starting point into geopoetics, um, Tony McManus's uh, Radical Field is the one I can best recommend. I have changed the title slightly as one always does when one writes the abstract versus when one actually writes the paper. Um, so I've changed it to Kenneth White and John Moriarty towards a, a green consciousness. Um, and um, this is now the moment of where, yes. Um, Kenneth White, I have known about for quite some time because um, I've been actively involved in the Geopoetic Society for maybe the most of a decade now and found it a very inspiring group. I had one of John Moriarty's books on my bookshelf for years and looked at it about 10 years ago and started it and left it and then looked at it about 12 months ago and started it and said, wow. And ever since then, I have been reading almost everything John Moriarty has written, and I am almost to the point of obsession with his writing. Um, I think he is so fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was preparing for the Tony McMahon's lecture and thinking about a topic, it struck me that these two men, I don't know whether I call them men or academics or philosophers or poets or intellectual nomads, because they're all those things, have so much in common, it might be nice to, to bring the two together. Um, and see what I know to common. Um, of course, there are a lot of other things about the two that I don't have time to bring into this talk, given the time frame. But to begin with their life trajectories, um, most of you are very familiar with Kenneth White. He was born in 1936 in Glasgow. He spent his childhood and adolescence on the Ayrshire coast. Uh, not from a very privileged family. His father was a, a railway signal man. Um, at university, Kenneth White obtained a double first in French and German from the University of Glasgow. And then he went down to study in Paris for a while. Um, he studied, he purchased an old farm in France initially to spend summers and autumns there. But in 1963, he returned to Glasgow and lectured in the university there until 1967. But he was disillusioned by the British literary scene and he resigned from his university post and moved to a city near the Pyrenees in southwest France where he lectured in English um, at the University of Bordeaux. He was expelled from the university after his involvement with student protests in May 1968 um, but after leaving there he continued to lecture at the University of Paris for a number of years um, and in 1979, he defended a state doctorate on the theme of intellectual nomadism. So you can see where that idea comes from. 
He subsequently got a personal chair in 20th century poetics at Paris Sorbonne, and he has since founded the International Institute of Geopoetics to further promote research into this academic field. I could spend the entire hour talking about his honors and awards, so they're there on the website, go and look for them. The one thing I would like to mention is that he now lives on the north coast of Brittany with his wife, Mary Claude, and I think she is she's a, a translator and a photographer, but I suspect she's also much more than that. You know, I suspect she is um, a catalyst for many of his ideas and an inspirer of many of his ideas and probably talks through many of his ideas with him. John Moriarty was born two years later than Kenneth White, so he was born in 1938 in County Kerry in the west of Ireland. Like Kenneth, he was from a non-privileged family. His father was a farmer. John showed early promise at school in Listole before going to school in University College Dublin. Like Kenneth, he gained a double first in his degree. Uh, John's was in philosophy and in English literature. And John was widely regarded as one of the finest minds of his generation. Now, John was so um, impressed with his own success that he didn't bother attending his school graduate or his university graduation and instead went off to Europe, ended up in London and um, sleeping on benches and thinking about nature. But then at some stage he got invited by the head of the philosophy department at Leeds University to read for a postgraduate degree. Um, and also he got the offer of part-time tutor to first year students. And while he was there, there was a visitor from the University of Manitoba, Canada, who was so impressed with his thinking that she invited him to apply for a position, a university position there. And although he didn't have postgraduate degrees, he actually got the job. Um, and he taught there for eight years. Um, but then like Kenneth White, he resigned his position. He was uncomfortable with academia. He wanted to return to nature. Um, so he returned to the West Coast of Ireland um, and he had money because, um, he had been paying into a pension without realizing it. So when he resigned from his university position, he had a small pot of money which helped him live for a start. And then he turned to gardening, of course, which was perfectly in tune with his empathy with nature. And then when the money ran out, he helped out in hotels and he became a live-in gardener in various places. Um, when he was given a piece of land, he started building his own house and he later moved back to Kerry um, he died at the untimely age of 69, um, but before his death, he received an honorary doctorate from University College Galway. He had to be persuaded hard to take this doctorate because for him, accepting the doctorate was somehow legitimizing the type of education that he didn't really approve of. So in summary, both men are contemporaries, one born in 1936, the other in 1938. Both grew up in non-privileged rural locations. Both were highly intelligent men, um, having gained a double first in their degrees. Both were deeply uncomfortable in their academic institutions. Both resigned from good, uh, university positions. Both are nonconformist intellectual nomads who received university recognition. Both were strongly influenced by philosophy, and that's an area I would love to explore more another time, the philosophers who would influence both of them, because there's a remarkable correlation there, and both published voraciously. Um, so I'm going to come to their publications, but before I do that, I just want to play a very short video of Dreamtime Revisited, which is just two minutes. It's about John Moriarty and hopefully this works. In Ireland, having many simultaneous and sequent identities 
and living as he does in many ages, authors of many names. Some days I walk out my own door and I find myself walking in an undamageable dimension of the universe. And for as long as I am out there seeing things as I do, I live in the dimension of Ireland called Ola. Mm -hmm. In raising my visor on an island, I saw every field, every flower that here lies low. And the wind from the snake that now she is cold. In an old town, town complete my dream, I searched for a name, no headstone had her bought. In old mirrors, I searched for the face I had dreamed of. For a year in that town, I was told from the throat, I told the old lies, but the night we touched hands, we longed for the woods. And like nightingales, I have no tongue from the hips. So now I want to look at their publications. Um, Kenneth White has published voraciously. Uh, he has launched, he's published a range of poetry anthologies, narratives, and collections of essays in both English and French. I have just a selection up there on the slide, but it's a tiny snapshot. Um, one particular genre of Kenneth White's that I'd like to draw attention to are what are called his way books. And these are prose narrative books, which combine mental investigations with geographical explorations of various territories and terrains. Now, the reaction to Kenneth White has been um, contradictory. Um, and I'm borrowing a bit from Nari here. Um, some people hail his poetry as groundbreaking and radical, and others kind of dismiss him as a continental celebrity um, and exclude him from the poetry anthologies and from Scotland's literary canon. But the Irish Nobel Prize winner Seamus Heaney said of White's poetry that it was erudite, elemental, big and bold, and a manifestation of the kind of poetry that Hugh MacDiarmid hoped for. In contrast, British Adam Thorpe said of White that he is, sorry, not in contrast, um, an intellectual nomad of genius. But Scottish journalist Ian Bell says, White's work has a, a certain rhetorical force, but it is a windy sort of rhetoric. Poet and environmental activist Gary Schneider remarks, what other poet gives us clarity, emptiness, purity of spirit, and north of the soul, a pathless path? And now I'm going to move on to some of the publications of John Moriarty, um, bearing in mind that John died at the age of 69. Now, John, two weeks before he died from cancer at the age of 69, John Moriarty sent the checked proofs of the second part of his autobiography, Nostos, to Lilliput Press, a very prestigious press in Dublin, who have published most of his writings. And if you are interested in following up John Moriarty, I suggest you go to the website of Lilliput Press. During the last two years of his life, John managed to finish and publish three other books, Invoking Ireland, which was challenging Irish attitudes to their land, history, religion, and culture, 
Night Journey to Budgaya, a monumental work which builds a vision that confronts our Western Enlightenment assumptions and conceptions, and Serious Sounds, a personal reflection on the Christian Seven Sacraments. Um, John Moriarty has been described by Michael Higgins, not the President Michael Higgins, but a Professor Michael Higgins, um, as an echo poet, keen on drawing on the vast sources of primitive mythologies, ancient narratives and contemporary insights in science and spirituality to help us redirect humanity towards an evolutionary understanding that takes seriously its obligations to the planet. Like White, Moriarty has divided opinion. Several of his books have won awards. His writing has been described as visionary, but it's also described as dense and difficult and requiring a knowledge of myth. Um, I would like to respond on that point and say that if you approach John's books just to read them, they are heavy going. But if you listen to them and read them aloud, so in other words, if you bring some of your other senses to bear on them, they're much easier to understand. And John also publishes a glossary at the end of each of his books. So when he refers to a myth, the story of the myth is at the back of the glossary. But John Moriarty has been neglected in the Irish literary canon, although now that is changing. Uh, just very briefly to point to a few of the critiques of Kenneth White's works. Here you will see The Radical Field by Tony McManus, and I think this should be your first port of call if you haven't um, entered this field of reading before. Um, I would also highly recommend Grounding a Work, Essays on the Work of Kenneth, Grounding a World, Essays on the Work of Kenneth White, um, which Nari was involved in. Um, the third one is a very recent one, which I haven't yet read. In the case of John Moriarty, um, again, these published by Lilliput Press, um, you have a number of readers. So introducing John Moriarty in his own words, a hut at the edge of the village and a Moriarty reader are readers, readings with extracts from most of his books. And then John Moriarty, not the whole story, uh, which is an excellent read contextualizing um, John's work. But for the rest of this talk, I want to concentrate on in their thinking what the two men um, had in common. And I want to think about the concept of wisdom. And I was going to use epistemology and knowledge, but I think perhaps wisdom is the best word to capture it. And both White and Moriarty proposed a radical new way of knowing, which completely disrupts and challenges our system of education. In schools and universities, we fill our students' heads with facts. We ourselves are drowning in information that is presented to us at an ever increasing speed via the internet and electronic gadgets. Now for philosophers such as Husserl, the founder of transcendental phenomenology, objectivism is naivety. And in order to understand things, we must strip them of the superfluous. Instead of filling our heads with facts and things, both White and Moriarty proposed emptiness rather than fullness as the way forward. As McManus notes, this is like the Buddhist recommendation of emptying the mind. And Kenneth White highlights this in a poem um, with the line, a gull's cry emptied my skull. And I think the sound correspondence between gull and skull was deliberate to show that um, as the gull's cry emptied his skull, the gull's cry became his skull and there was that perfect understanding between one and the other. John Moriarty tells about an experiment where he endeavored to empty his head and he talked about going into a field where one day a hare had sprung away from his feet and before he knew where he was and what was what 
John was down on the ground, easing his head uh, face down into the warm form that was left by the hair. And it was a perfect sheltering fit. And as he lay there breathing in the rich warmth and the rich musk, he asked for it to be two things. He asked for it to be a poultice sucking out all that was damaging and limiting in the European way of seeing and knowing things. And that done, he asked for it to be a cocoon bringing a new and blessed mind, a mind of nature to life itself. So how do we know? The way of knowing that John and um, Kenneth White advocated uh, was a way of knowing that prioritizes the body, the gut and the senses rather than the mind. Uh, we must redefine the process of gaining wisdom, emptying ourselves of facts and figures, instead allowing ourselves and our bodies to engage directly with nature. Both Moriarty and White recommend engagement directly with that which you wish to know. White points to Basho, the 17th century Japanese poet who says, if you want to learn about the pine, go to the pine. If you want to learn about the bamboo, go to the bamboo. And in doing so, you must leave your subjective preconceptions about yourself behind. Otherwise, you are only imposing yourself on the object and you do not actually learn. This is more about experience rather than information. The Westerner who tries to question and gets all wordy about a flower kills it while he's doing so. The thinking process, be it metaphysical, religious, anthropocentric, destroys the phenomena of the world. Basho, when he wants us to understand a flower, looks at it, sees it, and allows his feeling to remain silent, inviting the reader to reach the same feeling by achieving the same perception. John Moriarty makes a similar point about how formal education gets in the way of wisdom. In a story about showing a professor around one of the gardens he was working in, John says, and I quote, I had recently walked through the wood with Professor Westhoff. Delightedly, as we walked this way and that, he filled page after page after page of his notebook with the names of what quite clearly to him were botanical wonders, revelations, almost not just familiar specimens. We stood there for a long time, inhaling its almost overwhelming musk at a badger earth. Approaching a patch of old broken weeds, we provoked three wild ducks into a conflagration of loud calling. We walked past a roofless ruin, its stones not yet completely covered in pelts of lichen and moss. So giving us a rough idea of when it might have been abandoned. We doubled back, crisscrossing the whole place all over again, and then we re-emerged. And I was disappointed, thinking, the professor had walked through the wood, but at no point had he walked into it. As for example, in the same way that Nan Shepherd walked into the mountain. Having an educated expert eye, the professor met his own knowledge, but he didn't meet the wood. This process of knowing advocated by White and Moriarty is a complete reversal and disruption of the way we acquire knowledge in formal systems of education. More significantly, it is a rejection of our indigenous relationship with nature. Kenneth White draws attention to our ancient narratives shared between Ireland and Scotland, which displayed a strong naturalistic consciousness. The Kailach 
also known as the earth goddess, sometimes appeared in the guise of a bird, perhaps a crow, a skull, a cormorant, or a heron. The relationship between human and animal was fluid. White points out that in key Celtic lore surrounding the figure of Fionn and the Fiona, his sons Oscar and Oisin have names related to the deer. In a different story, the story of Art, King of Tara, John Mariarty notes a similar phenomenon. The name Art means bear. Mariarty retells the story of Art, or bear, who knows he was about to be killed by a pretender to the throne, lay with the daughter of a famous druid. The child that was ensued was subsequently stolen by a wolf, who suckled the child along with her own wolf cubs. Later, the child was rescued from the wolf and was restored to his rightful position as King of Tara. The name of this boy, child, was Cormac, the son of bear and human and suckled by a wolf. So boy, bear and wolf are foster brothers, a relationship we could not envision today. A relationship that has been destroyed by Cartesian dualism. Modernity as White sees it began with Cartesian dualism. And for both White and Moriarty, the paradigm with modernity is no longer creature and creature as it was in the Middle Ages nor is it the bombastic humanism of the Renaissance, it is now subject, object. And with this subject, object goes a project. And the project is for the human to become the master and possessor of nature. Our relationship with nature has changed from us to we and them. And along with this, the object is more and more objectivized, reduced to material to be exploited. The outside disappears more and more. Modern man doesn't see a forest, far less live with it, according to White. What he sees is a quantity of future planks. He winds up sawing the branch on which he is seated. Modern man lives in a sterile environment, moving between traumas and nightmare. The end is written all over it. Indian writer Amitav Ghosh explains this crisis in terms of European colonists who tore across the world, viewing nature and land as something inert to be conquered and consumed without limits and the indigenous peoples as savages whose knowledge of nature was worthless and who needed to be erased. Of course, what Gosh doesn't mention is that European colonization also happened within Europe, and I would count Ireland and Scotland in that field. Our children and us are suffering from nature deficit disorder, and it is no longer cogito sum I think, therefore I am, and instead has become, I consume, therefore I am, or possibly even I am, therefore I consume. John Moriarty was appalled with the way we view things. Our eyes become tumours, seeing only their economical work, worth. We look at cows and see kilos of beef, gallons of milk, we look at pigs and see pork. We look at trees and see timber. And in the process, as Moriarty notes, we ourselves have become human resources, mere units of labor or skill for the businesses that own us. A reaction that he railed against, as you can see from this mural near Lilliput Press. We are more than transformed groceries. As well as our relationship with the natural world, we have also lost our relationship with the other world, however we might define that. White points to the shamanic attributes of Fionn and the Fiona, 
And he also describes some of his own shamanic experiences as a child. In his On Scottish Ground, White explains his encounter with an installation by Boyce in Basel, which was basically a heap of grey felt and a scattering of withered branches. Boyce adopted a shamanistic guide in many of his actions from the 1960s onwards. And here we have a depiction of a work from the Tate Gallery of a shamanic ritual, um, an image of a standing male figure, which has been overlaid with that of a crouching female figure, and both figures are shown without their head. However, the shape behind the man appears to be a head with an enlarged eye, and this may represent the third eye, which allows perception or wisdom on a higher or spiritual level. When Boyce came to Scotland in 1971, he was attracted to what he considered the last European wilderness, which ultimately with Richard de Marco culminated in, uh, culminated in the Celtic Kinnoch Rannoch, the Scottish symphony. From the plateau of Rannoch Moor here in Scotland, one can see Glencoe, the ultimate resting place of the companions of Fionn, the bearers of this shamanic tradition. And it was White's intuition that shamanism began after the retreat of the last glacier when man was hunting the animal. But it was a hunt conducted with respect rather than a sense of entitlement. It was a hunt with what White calls an earth sense that we have lost, a ground sense and a freshness of the world such as those men, the Finn men knew when they moved over an earth from which the ice had just recently receded. Both Moriarty and White had read and were strongly influenced by Eliot, the Romanian historian of religion, philosophy, and he was also an academic professor. And McManus commenting on White's perception of the shaman says that really what interests White is that the shaman goes beyond a poetic, therapeutic role in society. He goes beyond the role of the artist, beyond the role of the sociologist, beyond the role of the representative of culture or the upholder of aesthetic values. The shaman has a larger role to bring healing and wisdom. In his Invoking Ireland, Moriarty describes a shamanic experience which led him to new insights. As I've noted, shamans are healers. And Moriarty considered Western civilization as in serious need of healing from its disjuncture between humans and nature. In Moriarty's view, we need to take that shamanic journey back to our indigenous ways of thinking before it was impacted by Christianity, rationality and modernity. It is an indigenous way of knowing that was shared by many cultures globally. White sees a connection between Celtic naturalism, Eskimo vision, Siberian shamanism, Amerindian religion, and Japanese Shinto continued to Zen. In his writings, Moriarty draws on myths from Indians in California, Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Aboriginal, and Native American myths. In his Invoking Ireland, which is my favorite of John's books, Moriarty would claim, as did his iconic hero William Blake before him, that we took a wrong turn in the 17th and 18th century with Newton and Descartes, and then according to Moriarty in the 19th century with Darwin. And it's not that these eminent thinkers were wrong, but that we abandoned too much in our adoption of rationalism, materialism, and modern reductivism. To the point 
where our logical and empirical mind, according to Moriarty, is no longer a window, but a blind. Being homo sapiens, sapiens has become an addiction, a habit we will need to break if we are to survive our catastrophic impact on the planet. Moriarty diagnosed the earth with the homo sapiens, sapiens virus. The human race is currently in denial and has been for over a century and a half with regard to its long-term survival. This denial we can no longer afford. The world is HSS positive. Moriarty is critical of Irish people in the 19th century who started to walk away decisively from a native language that was a way of seeing and knowing. And in the 20th century, we started to walk away from a religion that contained many of its ideas and practices as a form of folk religion. And in our ambition, we have moved from rights or ITES that related us to time and eternity and moved to rights within a body politic. Could it be, he asked, that humans have moved too far too fast. Moriarty proposed a return to our indigenous narratives, which he personally was able to reconcile with Christianity. Moriarty offers an alternative vision where all things live ecumenically with all things, man with nature, magic and the divine. This vision is very much in keeping with White's premise that man is inseparably in nature and that knowledge and experience are multifaceted. I think that White would agree with Moriarty's prescription that we need to comb the Cartesian dualism out of our hair. Moriarty's invocation of Ireland exhibits a green consciousness that Alistair McIntosh noted in what's regarded as the first poem written in the Irish language. The poem which features in the writings of both White and Moriarty is from Celtic mythology. The poet is Avergeen Bluingal, who was chief bard of the Milesians, who invaded the Gaels in revenge for the killing of their great grand uncle by the three kings of the resident fairy folk, the Tua de Danon. Ultimately, there was a battle between the two of the Danon and the Milesians. But prior to the battle, the fairy folk tried to raise a magical storm to keep the Milesians from entering Ireland. But Aberdeen sang an invocation calling on the spirit of Ireland. And this is a poem which interconnects all the elements of the universe. And there is no hierarchization of the human at the top. So I'm going to play this. It's just two and a half minutes. Home grain Home ton chahan Home full mara Home dom shop nevi Home shake in all Home dear grain ya I'm not 
Significantly and symbolically, the poem was narrated by Aberdeen with one foot on the boat in the sea and the other on the shore. White talks about the seaboard or the literal shore to be a particularly significant space. He says, there we are close to the beginnings of life. We cannot but be aware there of the primordial rhythms, tidals, meteorological. In that space too, we have one foot as it were in humanity, that is inhabited, inscribed space, and the other on the non-human cosmos, chaos, cosmos, chaosmos. And I think it is vitally important to keep that dialogue alive. Maybe that's the motto for the Stravag on water. McManus notes, that when White taps into this particular relationship with the sea that permeates Celtic nature and thought, he does so in the long poem, Scotia Deserta, where he notes the stained glass window in the Fairly Kirk, which shows St. Kentigern on the seashore, book in hand, gulls careering around him and he preaching to them. Alistair McIntosh interprets Aberdeen's poems as evidence of a long-standing green spiritual consciousness in the Gaelic-speaking world. He suggests that this green consciousness pours out from all the Celtic creative forms, like a visual representation of the Celtic music itself. Celtic art is based on circularity, not work, and vinework patterns interlaced on ancient stones and in later sacred books graphically illustrate the interconnectedness of all things. This green consciousness is at the heart of White's geopoetics, which I borrowed here from Nari's slide, which says that we must perceive the human in relation to the earth to develop that sense of loss, which has been the spur for White's world. That is the geo in the geopoetics. The poetics covers that realization derived from the nomadizing. When the human being hits upon the genuine perception of reality, the desire to express that perception is part of it. That green consciousness is also at the heart of John Moriarty's vision from the earth. He says, we are not separate from the elements or the biosphere around us. We are one with our fellow creatures and with our habitats too. The earth does not only environ us, we are it. It is in us and we in it. No longer can we assert dominion over animals. Were we to damage, say, a river or a forest, we would only, after all, be damaging ourselves. Moriarty's and White's ideas on culture, mythology and ecology run as strong countercultures to received scientific, commercial and business wisdoms. 
Moriarty's counsel was one of walking on the surface of the earth without hurting it. We need what American poet Wallace Stevenson calls for a new intelligence, an intelligence that would lead us away from cruelly emptying the seas and burning forests and poisoning lakes and rivers, an intelligence that would protect languages and traditional cultural heritage also. If there were time, there would be a lot more to be explored in relation to these two men. If my audience had been philosophers, it would have been interesting to explore common philosophical influences. It would also be interesting to explore the poetry which deeply moved them both and which they both wrote so well. But as a first step today, I wanted to draw attention to Moriarty's and White's invocations for the way we behave with the earth, which is pretty much the same as current activists for climate change are calling for. Both Moriarty and White ask for a vision of humans as part of, but not dominating nature. And that option imposes an unbearable morality, a seemingly impossible responsibility of care. That is that we are the universe, the universe is us. And as Moriarty wrote, matter is mind in hibernation. Climate change is a scientific issue, but it is also a cultural one, which requires a major readjustment of the way we look at ourselves and see our place in it. A major readjustment of the way we know the world and value the world. If we take this interconnectedness seriously, that was advocated by both White and Moriarty, then we will know that in damaging the earth, we are damaging ourselves. Good, Margaret, thank you. That was wonderful, Marriott. Thank you very, very much for a really brilliant talk, really, um, really <clears throat> amazing sort of uh, synergies between those two thinkers sort of brought out there and um, yeah, pointing in the direction of, of, of where we need to sort of be applying their thought. Um, Nori, can I just check how long we have for discussion and questions here? Well, we've got uh, a deadline was 4.30, so we've got more than an hour if we want it. Right. <laughs> Great. Well, in which case, that means uh, if, if if it's all right for me still to chair and sort of uh, direct questions to Myra, uh, I'm gonna be a, a, a proper um, kind of authoritarian here and seize control because I would like to ask a question first. Um, um, thank you for a great talk, Myra. And, and uh, I really, uh, it resonates with me the need for some sort of alternative consciousness in terms of how humans view themselves in connection with nature um, in terms of going forward. But there is, however, one thing that I would quite like to push back on a little bit and, and maybe see how you respond to this. Um, this uh, idea that John Moriarty had of like, humans are the virus, um, I find quite a problematic. Um, okay. Okay, you, you want to clarify that? Go for yeah. it. Uh, it's not that humans are the virus. It's that our way of thinking has become the virus. Okay. Uh, not humans themselves, because humans are part of nature. Um, yeah. And uh, he would see that as part of the beauty of nature. Yes. But we have adapted a way of thinking that's destroying the earth. Yeah. And that's what he sees as the virus. Yes. Nice one. That's a great clarification. So in, in which case I can move the question on a little bit. In, in what sort of sense, uh, maybe like one of the things that I felt like maybe wasn't in the talk so much was uh, like how that relates to capitalism. Um, if you want to expand on that a little bit, that would be that, you know, moder modernity and capitalism, you know, are obviously intertwined, but are different. Um, so yeah, if you want to expand on that, that would be really um, good. 
well, the first thing I would say is um, that this lecture was focusing on those two men and what they thought. Uh, neither of them, um, well, they may have spoke about capitalism much more than I'm aware of. And I'm probably more know more about John Moriarty than I do about Kenneth White. Nari knows much more about Kenneth White and most of you do than I do. But they did talk about, um, John Moriarty talked a lot about how our world view has become obsessed with the economic value of things. And that's why I was talking about when we look at cows, we no longer see an animal, we see a product that is a resource or even human beings themselves have become resources for business, which I would see as part of capitalism. And I would see, you know, if there were time there's a very interesting, I don't know if any of the members of the degrowth movement in Scotland are here today, um, but there's a very interesting group in Scotland um, who have this, um, I think the magazine is called Degrowth, isn't it? This idea that we need to keep producing more and more um, somehow to survive and never asking when do we actually have enough. Um, so it's running counter very much to that idea of capitalism and saying, rather than thinking we always have to acquire something new, we might say, well, we actually have enough at this point. Um, and, you know, you see um, businesses um, where if they don't produce growth, then somehow they have failed. Um, and you know, um, this is the annual report is very much about growth or lack of it rather than the good the businesses did. I don't know if that answers your question or not. But. Yeah, that's great, Mary. Thank you. I would love to talk more about kind of nature culture divides and stuff like that, but uh, we, maybe another time we should let other people ask questions. So are there, is there anything else from the floor? And also, um, Oh, Elizabeth Rimmer, I'd love if you said something about that, please. Um, I, I would regard this session as more a conversation rather than a question answer session, partly because it takes the pressure off me, but also you are so rich in your knowledge of these things that I would gain from that. So I would like to regard this as a conversation rather than um, a question answer. Thank you. Oh, somebody has talked about the degrowth enough. That's the group I was talking about. Claire, would you mind saying something about them? Uh, I, I don't. I don't really. I mean, I'm. I'm not like part of them. But yeah. I have. I have been following, and I went to the their meeting at the COP um, yeah. in the Governor Way, and yeah, the magazine's called Less, and you can sign up to newsletters um, uh, through a website. So, uh, but it is really interesting, and the Less magazine, it's really. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a cultural perspective, I would say. So you have all the kind of the facts and figures on the economic stuff, but it's, it's definitely a cultural perspective on, um, on uh, well, and critique of, also of well, capitalism, but also um, in, yeah, the whole idea of not more, but less, but not less, but less isn't less, <laughs> less is more. So, yeah. Exactly, thank you. That was the group I was thinking of. Any other comments? Elizabeth, would you mind saying something about Thomas Berry? You're on mute. Thomas Berry was a, a Catholic priest in America, but he did a lot on ecology and deep ecology. Um, the, the, parallel that struck me is that that uh, phrase he uses that man is not no nature is not uh, a collection of objects but a communion of subjects and he wanted humans to see themselves as in conversation with all the other beings in the universe and not at all as superior um, the center for ecozoic studies um they seem a bit random i started following them and uh, i i told them about 
geopoetics of that somebody wrote back to me and said oh that sounds fabulous that sounds absolutely what we're looking for and I put I gave them the contact for Laura because I never heard any more about it they do a lot of um, small scale research and and they publish a lot of kind of personal responses to nature and climate and, uh, and stuff. I am not sure how much depth they're Ooh. getting, but uh, um, where are they? I think they're in Berkeley. Mm. But yes, you're right. Thomas Berry is another person that could be put, put with yeah. this mosaic really of thinkers um, mm -hmm. who had a common vision, but perhaps never knew one another. Yeah. Marit, would, would you say that um, the two uh, issues of his autobiography would be a good starting place to get an idea of his thinking as well as his life, or would it be better to start with some of the later books that you mentioned? Where, 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 where would you suggest? Uh, one book that I found particularly good was the recent uh, biography that came out of him, which was um, came out on him, which was called John Moriarty, not the whole story. Right. I thought that was very accessible, actually, and it contextualizes a lot of John's works. Um, and, you know, um, all of the readers are good ways of getting to know his work directly, but I think it's good to have a bit of background on John um, before actually reading John himself. So. That's, that would be my recommendation, John Moriarty, not the whole story. Um, the other thing I would say is that I know um, there's lots of YouTubes of John on the website um, because uh, the publishers have very generously allowed those to be there. And if you listen to John, he's fantastic. I mean, it's a pity that John's books, that someone didn't write them down as he told them because when you listen to him, He's quite clear. And um, so I think perhaps listening to John on YouTubes. Um, and I would also say that there's a new audio book coming out from Lilliput Press in June um, about John. And I think that would be a very good starting point as well. I think the publishers have um, put a link um, to John in, 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 in the, to John's books in, in the conversation. And William Eddy, do you want to say something? Yes, Brendan O'Donoghue's is very good. Do you want to say something about that? No. No. If not, then um, maybe Helen is her hand up. Yeah. Um, I like with that in mind I'd kind of like to go back to something you said right at the beginning and connect that up with um, things you were saying earlier which was about accessibility and lucidity in his writing and how you recommended read I mean I love the idea of going through the biography and thank you for that introduction and I didn't know anything about him before and that's that's a great way in but that idea you mentioned of reading his words aloud because that's sort of famously the way to understand Finnegan's Wake yes um and I do it with poetry but the idea of doing it with an academic prose book yeah. with somebody who has a wider consciousness than you know just a scientific I'm not saying just a scientific training to devalue that mm -hmm. but he's aware in a much more holistic way yeah. and that somehow his work is more accessible or comprehensible if you think yes. I'm fascinated with that notion in relation to the oral tradition and performance and all kinds of things. And I wondered if you could say anything else or anybody else who has more knowledge, um, more knowledge than me of that area could come in. While people are thinking, I know that John writes very poetically. So it's kind of prose poetry rather than straight poetry. Um, and I think um, that uh, when you, he, you know, he can be quite repetitive as well with some words, which can work very well in some poetry, but perhaps not in prose. So I think his choice of words is poetic rather than prose, but it's in prose form. And that's why I think if you, if you 
you know, the people who say John's work is dense are perhaps really falling foul of exactly the kind of thing he was saying. You're reading it with your rational eyes instead of reading it with your ears. Um, and I think that's part of what you need to do with it, with John. I don't know, and it's the oral tradition as well. Mm -hmm. um, I see William Eddy has put in the comment that John Moriarty and John O'Donoghue, both late now, um, there's an overlap between the two and that's definitely true. Um, they actually did meet um, John O'Donoghue invited John Moriarty to give a talk. Um, some, some one of the reviewers or one of the introductions to John's books or perhaps in an essay I read said that in some ways John O'Donoghue overshadowed John Moriarty, um, partly because John O'Donoghue is so accessible. You know, he's a very easy read. Uh, he's beautiful if you, if you like. I, I very much like John O'Donoghue. I think it's a, it's a beautiful read. Whereas Moriarty is more work. Uh, but they were both from the west of Ireland, both contemporaries, both had a lot of vision in common. So now we have John Moriarty, John O'Donoghue, Barry and Kenneth White all coming mm -hmm. together. So we need some women now. Nan Shepherd maybe next. Can I ask you, Marit, about um, Tim Robinson? Out, uh, oh, yes. In, uh, who wrote about the Aran Islands and uh, Connemara. And, yes. And he died at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the COVID pandemic uh, when he'd moved to London. But um, he, Tony McManus brought him over That's to right. Edinburgh to give a, a, a lecture or, or more. Um, Right at the beginning of the geopoetics movement, and I, I visited Tim and 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 his wife um, at Thronestone in um, just at the, in Connemara, and um, he was having these uh, Roundstone conversations with small groups of people who were visiting him. Mm -hmm. and if if um, I, Mike Mike Scott of the Water Boys visited them as well, but he found that Tim was was quite anti um, the spiritualism of, of W.B. Yeats. Yes. And the conversation didn't go very well from that point, he told me. So I wonder if how you might compare Robinson's approach to, uh, to the world and to places on the edge and, and life on, on, on islands and in remote places with the, um, the more spiritual thinkers like O'Donoghue and, and Moriarty. Yeah, um, the first thing I would say is that Robinson knew Moriarty. Right. And as far as I'm aware, it was at Robinson's invitation that Moriarty wrote his autobiography. Um, that Moriarty didn't really think, you know, why would I write an autobiography? Why would anybody be interested? It was, it was Tim Robinson actually got him to, to write that. Um, I think um, I think there's quite a difference actually between Robinson and the likes of John O'Donoghue and um, um, John Moriarty. And the difference is perhaps that there is, um, it's very hard to describe it, but there is a sense, if I say a, a sense of spirit, of course there's a sense of spirit in Robinson, but maybe there's a slight sense of spiritual in Moriarty and O'Donoghue. Um, and even as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, no, no, that's not quite right. Um, I know that we say um, there is a Christian spectrum and John O'Donoghue was very much, even though John O'Donoghue fell out with the Catholic Church um, and resigned his priesthood because um, he really couldn't reconcile the Catholic Church with his beliefs. And John Moriarty at one stage did think about becoming a, a, a monk or a priest, but he was actually drawing so many spiritual people in his talks, they told him not to because he was doing a much better job for the church than he would um, if he were actually a priest. Um, so there's more, I suppose there's more a Catholicism or a spiritualism about uh, John O'Donoghue and John Moriarty than, and less so about Robinson. 
But when I say Catholicism, it's definitely not Roman Catholicism. It is Celtic Catholicism or Celtic pagan Catholicism, if that makes sense. So it's, a, it's more a folk religion rather than an organized religion. Um, I think too that um, perhaps um, Tim Robinson was very concerned with place names and place identity that John, that uh, Moriarty wasn't, whereas perhaps Moriarty was more about narratives and mythology and going back to our ancient ways of thinking than Tim Robinson was. But there's certainly a package that go together. Um, another name I would mention in this context is Manchon Magan, um, who I would see in the same vein as drawing on, and who actually, um, launched one of John, John's readers lately, but Monaghan Magan, if you don't know him, M-A-G-A-N, um, he's written the book 32 Words for Fields in Irish, um, but he also writes a lot of newspaper columns, you know, about the myth of language and the magic of language um, and narrative and landscape and all of that. Um, and they're all, I see, you know, along a spectrum of, I think it's a geopoetic spectrum in a way, just perhaps not in the name of geopoetics, but I mean, if you ask me, was John Moriarty a geopoet? I'd say yes, but he didn't know it. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's often the reaction of of many, uh, particularly vi visual artists, who come across geopoetics. They they often say. Yeah, of course. Uh, that's what I've been doing for years. I just thought it was geopoetics. But it's a very common uh, reaction. And uh, I, I think it's, it's very true that, uh, that folk, when they, when they come across the concept of geopoetics, they immediately, they, when they go into it a little bit, they, they recognize it. And, and for their own artistic or scientific practice, I think that's uh, really true. There's lots of interesting comments in the chat. Um, there's um, William Eddy, who's a lot of interesting things to say. Um, he says, Tim Robinson was quite scathing of O'Donoghue and accused him of, do you want to tell us about that, William, or not? I don't know if Bill's. Or is Bill, okay. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I met um, Robinson a few years ago in Connemara, and um, he immediately dismissed John O'Donoghue as of no consequence in comparison to Moriarty. And I was very, I was very disappointed actually in what Robinson said. Um, as as I said in my note, he did eventually concede that uh, John O'Donoghue did some good in getting the conservation movement. Warren. Um, but uh, he, had, he had nothing really positive to say about John O'Donoghue. Um, and I, I wanted actually to ask Tim Robinson about John O'Donoghue, but uh, I got nowhere with him at all. Yeah. That's an interesting comment, and it's interesting that he compared Moriarty and O'Donoghue as well, I think. That's interesting for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Robinson wrote about uh, John Moriarty according on the chat from Gemma Smith between two mountains, Tim Robinson on John Moriarty. That's a uh, YouTube and it's very good. Right. I think I think it's a YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Aye, so right. Mm -hmm. Mark's had his hand up for a wee bit as well. Mark. Uh, you're still muted, Mark. I was probably naughty, did it remotely. Um, but um, it's really great uh, um, lecture and talk, Lorraine. And what really struck me is looking at the chat, the number of different perspectives that people are bringing. What about this one and that one and Leela and Bill and so on, talking about different perspectives. And it's like you were holding up, say with Kenneth White, I mean, this is the kind of 
metaphor or analogy of, of a diamond and we all look at it in different ways and the light shines through it and the darkness and the shades and so on. And then what you brought, you brought Moriarty and it gives us a different perspective and the ones, you know, we will always be drawn to the ones that we kind of, that make sense to us and where we're working at the moment. And I thank you for that because it, it, it illuminates certain things. Um, I mean, just as an aside, you know, the comments made by about O'Donoghue and so on, it's criticism of peers is, is not is not strange in the creative world or in the academy. You know, <laughs> let's face it, you know, and as my grandmother said, these people say more than their prayers often, you know. <laughs> and they regret them. I mean, Kenneth has been well known for criticising George Mackay Brown, which didn't go down terribly well in, in some spheres in Scotland. But one of the things I was wanting to ask you a wee bit more about is the view of shamanism. When yes. you talked about Joseph Hughes, and if you remember that you had him, uh, we had Ricky DeMarco and a wonderful kind of conversation a few months ago. And this idea that I really liked about the post glacial retreat sort of thing and the shamanism coming to the fore, and talked about the respect of the hunt, the respect, you know, the hunting, the respect for the animal and the beasts. Mm. I really liked that idea, and it struck me. I was thinking about the caves of Lascaux and Chauvet. Where you can see the aesthetic of tens of thousands of years ago, yeah. of the qualities of the understanding of our ancestors and the beauty. Mm. And that is a shaman. And you know, it's just struck me that's what the artistry and the depth yeah. meant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shamanism is is a word that does not come easily off my tongue. And whether that's I'm Irish or or what, you know, I always associate shamanism with. Um, other peoples um, and yet the more I think about it yeah. and then you see Kenneth White describing his own shamanic experience and mm -hmm. John Moriarty describing his own shamanistic uh, and then I think of some you know traditions we have in Ireland like hearing the banshee and things like that you know they're not it's actually they're not too far removed um, um, I, I, I'm not sure what, and that's why I said the other world, however you might define that, but it was going beyond what the eye can see. Yeah. And, and I like, yeah. yeah. I like the way you put yourself. that there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And about speaking about it, it, yeah. it, it strikes me that many of us were vaccinated early on by a Jesuit theology that doesn't allow us to think freely enough about it. I don't know if Elizabeth would agree with that, but there's something in it about. Uh, anyway, maybe others have got a view on it. Uh, thank you for that, Maria. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether we can save the chat because there's a whole lot here I want to take down before. Mm. Nari, do not switch off the leave this mm. the, the you meeting. Can, I think, yeah. Yeah. I want to, um, well, I I've actually I saved the first half from the AGM already, so then I'll try and save the, the second half. Um, from your from your uh, lecture as well, Maya. Thank you. Yeah, and right at the bottom right hand, when you go to the chat, there's a three wee dots next to the file, Maria. Yeah. And you just click on the three wee dots and it says save chat and bing. Yeah. Okay. Should Perhaps. be there, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll send out the chat and uh, once it's up on the, uh, the lecture, certainly, uh, on and send everyone who registered the link to these. That's what we've done before. So um, we can have a, I mean, there's, it's very rich chat, I must say. There's so many references there that uh, you need to follow up on, uh, which is a great a tribute to your lecture, I think, Marit, that so many people are, are chatting <laughs> and making comparisons and, and references to uh, other thinkers and poets and writers. I, I mean, I think it's more a tribute to Moriarty and White really in their thinking, but also what struck me when I was reading Moriarty and I, I had read White first and, then, you know, when you start putting them together, you can see that there's actually a lot of people thinking in parallel who don't necessarily know each other, but they're thinking in parallel and we need more of this kind of thoughts and more of, of bringing this together. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, 
Yeah. Michael, Michael Tucker has at least one or more classic books about shamanism. And he, yeah. in the early days of geopoetics, he, he came up to Scotland and, and gave, I think at Tony's invitation, he gave uh, one or more talks. I'm trying to remember, I, th I think it might have been up in, oh, it was at, the, he came to the, um, the 2003 uh, event at St Andrews University. Mm. Uh, and he, he took, he gave a talk there about shamanism and of course White was there and uh, and that was an interesting event. The, the Grounding a World is the book, uh, which if you join, you get a free copy of, is, is uh, has a whole number of um, very good essays in it about White's work. But one of the in most interesting things to me was that, and it relates to what you said at the beginning about the mixed reaction, the contradictory reaction uh, from uh, other Scottish poets and uh, and essayists to White's work. It was almost a mean-spirited approach that, that first greeted him when he came to, when his work began to be published again in 1989 in mm. Scotland by mainstream publishing at the time and then by Berlin. And the interesting thing was that None of the well-known poets and uh, at, at St Andrews University it came at all to that three-day conference event. So none of the people who wanted to be the, uh, the inheritors of, of uh, in poetry of Edwin Morgan and, and uh, Norman McKagan, the rest, you know, um, people like Don Patterson and. Uh, even Kathleen Jamie, none of them turned up, and yet they were all working in in at University of St Andrews. So it's it's there's quite a strong anti-white uh, attitude amongst established poets in Scotland, and I think that I think Helen made the point earlier that uh, you know there's a lot of uh, backbiting goes on and uh, niggling in the poetry world, but I think it's also true in the academic world, as, as, as uh, some of us know. I um, don't know how I got onto that, but uh, it seemed relevant at the time. <laughs> Woody, you want to say something? Um, just, um, yeah, I put my hand down maybe uh, in a minute. Um, just been, when Elizabeth mentioned uh, deep ecology earlier on, I was going to put in on that one, but what you said uh, a minute ago about reading people in conjunction, or whichever way you put it, uh, brought back that same idea. Um, I was looking there at, at the guy who was very much involved with the deep ecology movement, which was Arne Nace, the legendary Norwegian philosopher who coined the term ecosophy, which is quite similar in its own way to geopoetics. Um, and of course, he really got into that when he took early retirement from the University of Oslo, round about the time when White and uh, Moriarty and, and various other people, and somebody mentioned in the chat, Rachel Carson, were working and writing about connected issues, related issues to do with human nature, relationships, and so on. Uh, and White and Moriarty were both very widely read uh, one little research project would be, did they actually possibly read each other's and ignore it? Or did they refer to each other's work or not? They certainly, as far as I've read, either of them don't mention Arne Nace, who's quite a big name in this whole debate. So what I'm getting at is kind of, it would be interesting to dig a bit deeper into who read who. Mm -hmm. uh, and also th they all read this, this a large tranche of the same inspirational mm -hmm. base texts mm -hmm. and to my mind and I'm just putting that out as a, as a <laughs> whatever you call that metaphor cut among the pictures or something like that uh, when Nori talked about the way that, that, that the establishment in poetry ignored mm -hmm. white to mm -hmm. my mind that might just have something to do with the fact that he makes no bones about the fact that one of his chief influences was Heidegger, who is a persona non grata in intellectual self-respecting circles for all the wrong and some of the right reasons. So there's not a research project there possibly. Yep.
Dory Early didn't didn't catch that name. Heidegger. So Heidegger. Heidegger. So yeah. Heidegger. Yeah. And the, the new the new book out uh, with um, which I've been putting on Geopoetics News uh, has quite a lot about Heidegger uh, discussion between uh, the other author whose name yeah. escapes. Yeah. And Malpass and. Say again, Uli. Jeff Malpass. Jeff Malpass and Kenneth White. Yeah. There's quite a lot of philosophy in that in that uh, exchange, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say for people who haven't read much of Kenneth White, the Geopoetics website is a good place to find them. And I think you're offering a special deal on his latest book at the moment, and isn't this Centre? Am yeah. I right? Fund four fundamental. Yeah. Is what it's called? Yeah. It, it's a uh, thirty percent off. Uh, Deal. And uh, in fact, you can read a chunk, a big chunk of uh, an extract from that book on on my website. I wasn't able to put it on the geopoetics one, but it's there. It's there on mine, and there's probably about thirty odd pages of it. You know, the kind of thing you you get on some, you know, look inside type of thing. So before you buy it, you could you could try out uh, and some of that, and um, I think the. To get to Tony McManus's book, uh, The Radical F Field, I think the the last remaining copies are with Nanon, and if Nanon's okay with it, I'll I'll put her email address on the chat so that you know where you can get it, because I don't have spare copies, and neither I don't think you would get it on um, from any bookshop now. Um, so we'll be, give you that link if you want to follow up. Yeah. Nanon looks like she's maybe got something to say about that. <laughs> you'll need to unmute yourself, Nanon. Yeah. yeah, we could we can't hear you, Nanon. You'll need to unmute your microphone. Nori, would you be able to um, unmute Nanon? Yeah, sorry, sorry, I was typing something there. Um, I can try. Yeah, uh, wait a minute. I can't see Nanon. No, maybe it's on the next page. Oh yeah. Oh, there she is. Nanon, you've unmuted yourself. You can speak now. I can myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, sorry. So, the question was... Sorry. Are, you, are you okay with putting your email address on for po folk to... Yes, yes. I'm certainly okay to, uh, to have also uh, Tony's book uh, on, on uh, added on to the website. Yeah. yeah. I've got plenty of copies. I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Yep. Um, Alistair Kelly in the chat is talking about Gregory Bateson and his daughter Nora. I'd love some more feedback on that if Alistair is still with us and doesn't mind speaking. I don't know, Alistair. He's on. He's muted. I just asked him to unmute. Maybe he's gone for a cuppa. I just I think it's a very interesting link as well, particularly yeah. the work of his daughter Nora. Yeah, Kenneth White has referred to quite a lot of uh, Gregory Bateson's writings. That's true. His work. Uh, I've never be, been able to follow up Bateson's work, but he, he certainly sees him as a, a significant thinker and, and writer. Um, 
and uh, yeah, that. So that's another connection when we're looking at all the, the different. Uh, it's almost like a, the roots of a tree, you know. <laughs> um, all, all these different writers, all around the same area, the same field. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why was you think people are thinking about things? When you spoke at the beginning, Leonard, about the concept of emptiness, and you mentioned Basho and Matsuo Basho and, and, and others, um, I think that's a very good uh, lead into the, the conversation that we're going to have at the end of March with Alan Spence. Okay. We've, we've titled it Eastern Paths, um, mm. and it's really about the, the East how Eastern thinking has been influenced, has influenced uh, Alan Spence, who I, I certainly consider one of Scotland's finest writers, um, and thankfully still with us. Uh, but he, um, he told me some time ago that he was put onto Eastern uh, Buddhism, particularly by uh, Tom McGrath, who had a uh, very colourful history with the International Times and and then came to Scotland and, and was a major uh, theatre director and playwright. Uh, so Tom McGrath was very influential uh, on Alan Spence and also uh, Sri Chin, Chinmoy. Uh, and of course, Alan Spence is probably poetically is best known for several haiku books that he's written, including uh, Glasgow Zen, I think was his first one originally, and it was reprinted later, mm. Anangate. So we're going to be exploring, he and I are going to chat further about um, Eastern thinking and how it has influenced Alan Spence's work. And of course, uh, it's certainly influenced uh, Kenneth White's work. Mm. And what you're saying also uh, John Moriarty. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So that's that's interesting. So that's a connection between this talk and the next one. Yes, yes. And I, I hadn't expected that there would be that connection, but there it is. There it is. It's on the 24th, Thursday the 24th of March. It's in the, the AGM papers that we sent out uh, and it's at five o'clock. Uh, so I think that will be very interesting because of course, Alan Spence has written two novels that have been published or set in Japan. One about Th Thomas Glover, the, um, who is the uh, sort of Scottish merchant who, who had a very big influence in opening up Japan in the 19th century to, mm -hmm. to Western ways. And also, I think it's Hakuin, the, the Zen poet, he has a, a, a novel about him, and he's got another another novel that he's finished and he's about to get published, he hope, uh, again set in Japan. So there's a lot of Eastern uh, thinking and practice in Alan Spence's work. Mm. In, uh, in I mean, I must, I must say, you know, for me, it's very much a journey and, and what I present these days something I'm working on right now, but it has been involved by my involvement, it has been inspired by my involvement with the Chief Poetics really, because it's such a rich field and the members are so uh, creative and so um, knowledgeable. I hate using the word knowledgeable because it's the wrong word, but so familiar with, mm. um, different types of thinking and expressing etc um, that anybody who here who isn't a member of geopoetics I think should consider becoming one because um, there's so much to be learned from the group. Oh. That's, a, that's a fine tribute thank you very much Marit. Um, True. Yeah it's, uh, it's certainly beginning to take off I think in a way that it hasn't in the past. One of the things I'm working on, and I, I got a, an award from Creative Scotland to help finance, is, is my own um, uh, creative nonfiction book, 
uh, living on an island expressing the earth, which is really about my involvement in geopoetics over the years. So I think one of the, the things that has been missing in, in Scotland certainly is more writing about geopoetics and, the, and publishing in books. So it would be great for some of the folk here, you know, were inspired uh, by your lecture to, uh, to write more about your take on geopoetics. Um, and it's one, it's been a, an ambition of the Scottish Centre to, uh, to, to have more books about geopoetics out there. And I'm hoping to do that in, in the coming year. Um, if I can just cut down on some of the admin that I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and that should work in with the film as well, because the similar, uh, so similar themes, if not, dif you know, different approaches, obviously. Yes, I mean, I think the different ways of expressing are very important. Yeah. You know, music, artwork, poetry, um, songs, it's... Yeah, just see what, there's a lot more here. Sarah's made a really interesting comment about um, various sort of feminist thinkers in relation to geopoetics. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, would you like to say a bit more about that? Or it's, it's cool if you don't. <laughs> the, the comment speaks for itself. But uh, if you'd like to say more, that'd be really great. Um, is Marie Fleming still here? Uh, I don't mind them. Yeah. Um... I tell you, yeah. Sarah, yeah. yes. Sorry, no, you can. No, Sarah, please. Well, no, I mean, um, I mean, anybody my kind of age um, would know, any woman would know what women, you know, since 68, going to the 80s and all the different feminist ways of um, taking hold of thinking in some way or another, which broadly they never really have had a chance to, have they? Um, and I think women thinkers, I would, you know, particularly recommend those books, particularly perhaps Earth Muse. Um, it's their old books, but they are brilliant and of their time. And, you know, when women was really like artists like Jenny Holzer and politicized by texts and so on, from the 80s through to the 90s, there was a period when women kind of, they weren't, they weren't really postmodernists. They were people who were ahead of the game at, being connected to what we're all dealing with now, which is, you know, world issues. And I think that they were thinking through the importance of the planet or the body or the, you know, you know or the earth. Um, there were thinkers happening in the eighties and nineties, both for, for the philosophers and artists, women artists, who I think um, need uh, you know, um, now it's all coming to fruition. And I always thought that, you know, the death of the author and conceptual notions of postmodernism were just really, really not, um, they had to sort of disappear because we do need authors and we do need people saying, um, we do need an authored voice. And they're all rising up now, all of the different identities that we have on this planet are rising up to have a say. And, um, these early feminist authors have sort of got forgotten as well, in a way, in that. And I, I, uh, I'm just having a say for them. <laughs> and actually, I just want to say, so it's quite political about Soma Broadrib because she actually got fired from her academic department. Oh, and <laughs> she's had a she she did because because. It's a feminist critique of, of postmodernism, actually, but it goes into all of the roots of, um, of uh, why we've got these con constructs in society that we have. And um, uh, she, she, it, she, yeah, she, when I read into her, she sort of got silenced and she actually disappeared from academia. So I feel very strongly about promoting her book, actually. Um, I think there's some terrible we're all talking about some actually terrible things that are, that our societies uh, we all know is happening, and I think we should all be doing something about it. So, yeah, enough from me now. Just following on from that, Sarah, which is you know absolutely fascinating, as well as reading in conjunction with current practitioners we're also reading in conjunction within the, the past. 
but when you were speaking it just made me think of something that I have very often this year and recently in relation to feminism and race and all kinds of other things is that every generation has to reinvent the wheel mm. and that becomes exhausting I'm very I grew up with some of the reading some of the authors and others in, in literature um, that you mention and it seems that younger people aren't necessarily aware of them and that's not their fault or their teachers but it is just what a monolith patriarchy is um if i'm generalizing there and how we just have to keep and we've seen this just in awful ways uh, particularly in relation to race but gender politics and all kinds of things very recently and we're very aware of it with what's going on in the met at the moment um and i want to be more hopeful than that but in in conjunction with that is a is a sadness really and a kind of grief um, um, and that there is also a long tradition of green politics in writing I think Pat mentioned in the chat John Clare a while back and there we can you know we go back to the romantics and beyond that who had a consciousness about this but not the same vocabularies that we have um, and I guess all we can do is keep doing it and have meetings like this and lectures like this that increase the awareness and the number of people who see alternatives and yeah I agree yeah fantastic um lecture can I bring Anna Fleming in let me just um find out how to put my video on oh hello, hello everyone um yeah thanks for inviting me along it's so lovely to hear um, really interesting chat about this and, and really nice to hear this emphasis on women's stuff at the end here this yeah um i have just published a book that i suppose is in this geopoetics vein although i you know would never pitch it as that um i've got a copy here just to proudly display like a proud new mother um it's called time on rock a climber's route into the mountains um and and it's about rock climbing which is maybe not what you'd immediately think of when you think geopoetics um, but I was very inspired by a lot of the names we've heard here today in terms of Tim Robinson and Nan Shepherd and and in writing this book you know I really wanted to tell a very different story of, of mountains and climbing and, and relationship to rock and place and self um, and yeah, and it's interesting. So it's been published by Canongate. So it's very much in the mainstream and in the media at the moment. So it's quite, yeah, interesting seeing how that's going down and, and the reviews are lovely. It's only been out a month and, and they've all been great. Um, and one of the big things I've seen, the big trend is, is just comparing the book to Nan Shepherd, which obviously I'm immensely flattered about because she's such an amazing writer. Um, but it does also make me think that there needs to be more work done around women and, and geopoetics. If, you know, the only, like the big point of comparison that I get is Nan Shepherd. That yeah, suggests to me that there just isn't enough of those women's stories and books out there um, is, is my reflection on that. Anna, would you put a link to the book or to the launch maybe in the chat, please? Sure. Yeah, I'll be launching it in um, in Edinburgh in Toppings on the 4th of March, so I'll put a wee link in the chat now. I think it almost is a reflection of the, sorry to keep coming in, but these eyes, things are sparking off as, as we're going along here, but it's almost a reflection of the discussion we had in our AGM, where the, of the lack of women members on our committee, our council, uh, body and we've begun to uh, address that today. We now have four women uh, on going to be on the, the council for the coming year, which is big, which is real progress. Um, but I think it's also true of, I would say, of Kenneth White's work that most of the thinkers and writers that he refers to in his work are men, and it's something that he's been um, criticised for in the past and in the present, presumably. Um, of course, there are sort of historical reasons for that um, in terms of uh, just the access to publishing books and so on. But three of the, the women that I'm going to be uh, at least trying to 
how we would say that I'm going to be writing about in this uh, geopoetics book is um, Joan Eardley, who I think her work uh, very much reflects uh, geopoetics in, in the visual arts. Uh, Rachel Carson, who I'm particularly interested in her uh, writings on the sea. Uh, she, she, before Silent Spring, she, she, she uh, wrote and published three, three books uh, related to the, to the sea. Um, and again, she's someone that you don't hear as much of nowadays as you should do. Um, and of course, Nan Shepard is the other, uh, the other person. So I think there is work to be done to actually uh, uncover the connections between lots of uh, women artists and indeed scientists and thinkers and geopoetics. So there's another open field for anyone who who's uh, interested and who would like to take these uh, connections further. And also perhaps a special issue on Stravag at some point. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Myra, I had uh, a quick question to ask as well. You talked about um, John's book Invoking Ireland. Yes. That sort of changed perceptions or imaginaries of Ireland. Yes. Um, I just wondered what what perceptions of Ireland did it change, and what did it sort of like try and replace it with? If it tried to replace it, with anything? Um, it it um, the New Ireland as he would have it um, was an Ireland which had value on its ancient narratives, not as stories, but as wisdom. So for example, he takes a lot of the Celtic narratives and he reinterprets them with an ecological message. Um, so like a very tiny example is the story of art I took, you know, where you had uh, boy and wolf and whatever it was, foster brothers. Um, so this idea of recreating the perception of the world that the, the Ireland had lost um, with the, so it, um, he also thought, for example, it could be very involved in, in, in linking with Eastern places and Hindu places and things like that. But I think the main, the crux of it was really changing and this was for everywhere really but he just focused on Ireland but changing the way we think about our place in the universe and that if we can change that everything else would follow so like it wasn't a denial of science or any of that but that that alone is not going to work and we need to change the way people think about ourselves in the universe so that was the new Ireland thanks it's a very rich chat, I must say. So I don't think we've had ever had one as quite as, you know, mind expanding as this one. <laughs> when you save the chat, where does it end up? It, it, you can do it, you download it to your own computer. Ah, okay. And, and I'll download it to mine and I will then share yeah. that link to all those who registered for today. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Where it ends up when you save it, Mary, is nobody else knows the other that, that you haven't yet imagined, but it's there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Save chat, it then says um, show in Finder. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mind, or it might say should, so if you click show and finder, then you'll have it it like open in a window because yeah, you're right, Helen. It kind of bites it away in some 
obscure folder. <laughs> it usually stays on desktop, I find. I mean, it may depend on whether you're using a Mac or a PC. It stays on the desktop, but if I then close it without saving it somewhere where I know I can never find it again. So yeah. <laughs> copy it into a work file, but yeah, if Norris sending it round, that's the yeah. easiest thing. You know, a few days or a week at the most, but uh, because there usually will be some other t text in it as well as the chat, but the, the chat will come to everyone as well. Uh, so don't worry that if you haven't had a chance to know, I haven't had a chance to know everything down either, but it's all there. And Callum, if you save it as well, and several of us are saving, Patrick, Pat, if you could save it too, then we shouldn't, uh, <laughs> we should be okay. We should be fine. Yeah. It's well worth saving, definitely, and sharing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know about you, Callum. I, I feel we've just about exhausted the. Yeah, I was just about to ask, you know, do <laughs> you think we're there? Yeah. It's been it's been a wonderful turnout. We've, we've still got 46, 45 people here. And right through your lecture, uh, we had about 59 Barrett. So I think that that's, that's despite the two matches. <laughs> uh, yeah, despite the problems with Zoom that I always get into. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So but those, those folk who weren't able to will who weren't able to get in will still be able to view the the recording at least of the lecture and the discussion which has been really uh, very very worth watching again I would suggest. Um, Callum before you do I'd like to thank ask everyone to thank Marit for a wonderful lecture and and a very full uh, discussion conversation afterwards so can mm -hmm. we bring thanking Marit. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. You'd say that you're just more than proud, more than proud, Marit. Um, and you, you've you've given us so many things to follow up here uh, from from today. That I uh, hope some of us will do that. I'm sure some will. Um, so. Thankfully, there's going to be a wee bit of a rest now, for, certainly for me. In terms of events, the next thing I think is the one with Alan Spence on the 24th of March. And uh, uh, the same sort of uh, set up five, five o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, and uh, that should be well worth uh, attending and uh, looking in on. We can continue some of the, these points of conversation there. Uh, but uh, Callum, do you want to say anything further? Uh, no, not really. I don't really have anything to add apart from just to echo um, what you said in terms of thanks to Myra in particular for, for our lecture today. Um, and yeah, you said everything about kind of future events that sort of need to happen and stuff like that. Um, I'll save the chat. Uh, so I'll stay on to the end with, with you, Nori, whilst everybody signs out and make sure it's saved and make sure it gets circulated. So um, yeah, and thanks everybody as well for, for their contributions, actually. Um, there's uh, these discussions aren't stimulating unless people participate. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much for that. Um, so, and we'll see you at the next yeah. event. If anyone wants to join the Scottish Centre for Geopoetics and they haven't already, there's um, there's two ways you can do it. One is on our website, uh, www.geopoetics.org.uk, and the other one is. Uh, but you can still contribute to the, the film funding. Uh, and if you do that, uh, if you pay £10, then you get a year's free membership and the book, Growing a World. And, you know, if you get 20, then you get uh, two. So two, two years of free membership. So it's, uh, there's, there's certainly different ways you can join us if you, if you haven't already done so. Uh, it's a growing movement, I would say, <laughs> pleased to say. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending today and for, as Callum has said, for contributing so well to uh, today's lecture and discussion and indeed contributing to our AGM, which I think has made it one of our most successful AGMs that I can recall. 
So thanks everyone again for being here. <laughs> we'll see you. <laughs> <Bye. laughs>